Chapter One of The Brass Bottle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Wheel. The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. Chapter One Horace Ventimore Receives a Commission. This day six weeks, just six weeks ago, Horace Ventimore said, half aloud, to himself, and pulled out his watch. Half past twelve! What was I doing at half past twelve? As he sat at the window of his office in Great Cloister Street, Westminster, he made his thoughts travel back to a certain glorious morning in August, which now seemed so remote and irrecoverable. At this precise time, he was waiting on the balcony of the Hotel de la Plage, the sole hostelry of St. Luke on Port, the tiny Normandy watering place upon which, by some happy inspiration, he had lighted during a solitary cycling tour, waiting until she should appear. He could see the whole scene, the tiny cove with the violet shadow of the cliff sleeping on the green water, the swell of the waves lazily lapping against the diving board from which he had plunged half an hour before. He remembered the long swim out to the boy, the exhilarated anticipation with which he had dressed and climbed the steep path to the hotel terrace. For was he not to pass the whole remainder of that blissful day in Sylvia Futvoye's society? Were they not to cycle together? There were, of course, others of the party, but they didn't count. To cycle over to Villette, to picnic there under the cliff, and ride back, always together, in the sweet-scented dusk, over the slopes, between the poplars or the cornfields glowing golden against a sky of warm purple. Now he saw himself going round to the gravelled courtyard in front of the hotel, with a sudden dread of missing her. There was nothing there but the little low cart, with its canvas tilt which was to convey Professor Fatvoy and his wife to the place of rendezvous. There was Sylvia at last, distractingly fair and fresh in her cool pink blouse and cream-coloured skirt, how gracious and friendly and generally delightful she had been throughout that unforgettable day, which was supreme amongst others only a little less perfect, and all now fled for ever. They had had drawbacks, it was true. Old Futvoye was perhaps the least bit of a bore at times, with his interminable disquisitions on Egyptian art and ancient Oriental character writing, in which he seemed convinced that Horace must feel a perfervid interest as indeed he thought it politic to affect. The professor was a most learned archaeologist, and positively bulged with information on his favourite subjects. But it is just possible that Horace might have been less curious concerning the distinction between cuneiform and Aramean, or Cufic and Arabic inscriptions, if his informant had happened to be the father of anybody else. However, such insincerities as these are but so many evidences of sincerity. So, with self-tormenting ingenuity, Horace conjured up various pictures from that Norman holiday of his. The little half-timbered cottages with their faded blue shutters and the rushes growing out of their thatch roofs. The spires of village churches gleaming above the bronze-green beaches. The bold headlands, their ochre and yellow cliffs contrasting grimly with the soft ridges of the turf above them. The tethered black-and-white cattle grazing peacefully against a background of lapis lazuli and malachite sea and in every scene the sensation of Sylvia's near presence, the sound of her voice in his ears. And now? He looked up from the papers and tracing cloth on his desk, and round the small panelled room which served him as an office, at the framed plans and photographs, the set squares and T-squares on the walls, and felt a dull resentment against his surroundings. From his window he commanded a cheerful view of a tall, mouldering wall, once part of the abbey boundaries, surmounted by chevaux de frise, above whose rust-attenuated spikes some plane trees stretched their yellowing branches. She would have come to care for me, Horace's thoughts ran on, disjointedly. I could have sworn that, that last day of all, and her people didn't seem to object to me. Her mother asked me cordially enough to call on them when they're back in town. When I did... When he had called, there had been a difference. Not an unusual sequence to an acquaintanceship begun in a continental watering place. 
It was difficult to define, but unmistakable. A certain formality and constraint on Mrs. Futvoye's part, and even on Sylvia's, which seemed intended to warn him that it is not every friendship that survives the Channel Passage. So he had gone away, sore at heart, but fully recognising that any advances in future must come from their side. They might ask him to dinner, or at least to call again, but more than a month had passed, and they had made no sign. No, it was all over. He must consider himself dropped. After all, he told himself with a short and anything but mirthful laugh, it's natural enough. Mrs. Futvoye has probably been making inquiries about my professional prospects. It's better as it is. What earthly chance have I got of marrying unless I can get work of my own? It's all I can do to keep myself decently. I've no right to dream of asking anyone, to say nothing of Sylvia, to marry me. I should only be rushing into temptation if I saw any more of her. She's not for a poor beggar like me, who was born unlucky. Well, whining won't do any good. Let's have a look at Beaver's latest performance. He spread out a large, coloured plan, in a corner of which appeared the name of William Beaver, architect, and began to study it in a spirit of anything but appreciation. Beaver gets on, he said to himself. Heaven knows that I don't grudge him his success. He's a good fellow, though he does build architectural atrocities and seems to like them. Who am I to give myself airs? He's successful, I'm not. Yet, if I only had his opportunities, what wouldn't I make of them? Let it be said here that this was not the ordinary self-delusion of an incompetent. Ventimore really had talent above the average, with ideals and ambitions which might under better conditions have attained recognition and fulfilment before this. But he was not quite energetic enough, besides being too proud, to push himself into notice, and hitherto he had met with persistent ill-luck. So Horace had no other occupation now but to give Beaver, whose offices and clerk he shared, such slight assistance as he might require, and it was by no means cheering to feel that every year of this enforced semi-idleness left him further handicapped in the race for wealth and fame, for he had already passed his twenty-eighth birthday. If Miss Sylvia Futvoye had indeed felt attracted towards him at one time, it was not altogether incomprehensible. Horace Ventimore was not a model of manly beauty. Models of manly beauty are rare out of novels, and seldom interesting in them. But his clear-cut, clean-shaven face possessed a certain distinction, and if there were faint satirical lines about the mouth, they were redeemed by the expression of the grey-blue eyes, which were remarkably frank and pleasant. He was well made, and tall enough to escape all danger of being described as short, fair-haired and pale, without being unhealthily pallid in complexion, and he gave the impression of being a man who took life as it came, and whose sense of humour would serve as a lining for most clouds that might darken his horizon. There was a rap at the door which communicated with Beaver's office, and Beaver himself, a florid, thick-set man, with small side-whiskers, burst in. I say, Ventimore, you didn't run off with the plans for that house I'm building at Larchmere, did you? Because, ah, oh, I see you're looking over them. Sorry to deprive you, but... Thanks, old fellow. Take them, by all means. I've seen all I wanted to see. Well, I'm just off to Larchmere now. Want to be there to check the quantities. And there's my other house at Fiddleston. I must go on afterwards and set it out, so I shall probably be away some days. I'm taking Harrison down, too. You won't be wanting him, eh? Ventimore laughed. I can manage to do nothing without a clerk to help me. Your necessity is greater than mine. Here are the plans. I'm rather pleased with them myself, you know, said Beaver. That roof ought to look well, eh? Good idea of mine lightening that slate with that ornamental tile work along the top. You saw I put in one of your windows, with just a trifling addition— I was almost inclined to keep both gables alike, as you suggested, but it struck me a little variety, one red brick and the other parged, would be more out of the way. Oh, much, agreed Ventimore, knowing that to disagree was useless. Not mind you, continued Beaver, that I believe in going in for too much originality in domestic architecture. The average client no more wants an original house than he wants an original hat. He wants something he won't feel a fool in. I've often thought, old man, that perhaps the reason why you haven't got on, you don't mind me speaking candidly, do you? Not a bit, said Ventimore cheerfully. Candor's the cement of friendship. Dab it on. Well, 
I was only here to say that you do yourself no good by all those confoundedly unconventional ideas of yours. If you had your chance tomorrow, it's my belief you'd throw it away by insisting on some fantastic fad or other. These speculations are a trifle premature, considering there doesn't seem the remotest prospect of my ever getting a chance at all. I got mine before I'd set up six months, said Beaver. The great thing, however, he went on with a flavour of personal application, is to know how to use it when it does come. Well, I must be off if I mean to catch that one o'clock from Waterloo. You'll see to anything that may come in for me while I'm away, won't you, and let me know. Oh, by the way, the quantity surveyor has just sent in the quantities for that schoolroom at Woodford. Do you mind running through them and seeing that they're right? And there's the specification for the new wing at Tusculum Lodge. You might draft that some time when you've nothing else to do. You'll find all the papers on my desk. Thanks awfully, old chap. And Beaver hurried back to his own room where for the next few minutes he could be heard bustling Harrison, the clerk, to make haste. Then a hansom was whistled for, there were footsteps down the old stairs, the sounds of a departing vehicle on the uneven stones, and after that, silence and solitude. It was not in nature to avoid feeling a little envious. Beaver had work to do in the world, even if it chiefly consisted in profaning sylvan retreats by smug or pretentious villas, it was still work, which entitled him to consideration and respect in the eyes of all right-minded persons. And nobody believed in Horace. As yet, he'd never known the satisfaction of seeing the work of his brain realised in stone and brick and mortar. No building stood anywhere to bear testimony to his existence and capability long after he himself should have passed away. It was not a profitable train of thought, and to escape from it he went into Beaver's room and fetched the documents he had mentioned. At least they would keep him occupied until it was time to go to his club and lunch. He had no sooner settled down to his calculations, however, when he heard a shuffling step on the landing, followed by a knock at Beaver's office. More work for Beaver, he thought. What luck that fellow has. I'd better go in and explain that he's just left town on business. But on entering the adjoining room, he heard the knocking repeated, this time at his own door and hastening back to put an end to this somewhat undignified form of hide-and-seek, he discovered that this visitor, at least, was legitimately his, and was, in fact, no other than Professor Anthony Futfoy himself. The professor was standing in the doorway, peering short-sightedly through his convex glasses. His head protruded from his loosely fitting greatcoat with an irresistible suggestion of an inquiring tortoise. To Horace, his appearance was more welcome than that of the wealthiest client. For why should Sylvia's father take the trouble to pay him this visit, unless he still wished to continue the acquaintanceship? It might even be that he was the bearer of some message or invitation. So, although to an impartial eye, the professor might not seem the kind of elderly gentleman whose society would produce any wild degree of exhilaration, Horace was unfeignedly delighted to see him. "'Extremely kind of you to come and see me like this, sir,' he said warmly, after establishing him in the solitary armchair, reserved for hypothetical clients. "'Not at all. I'm afraid your visit to Cottesmore Garden some time ago was something of a disappointment.' "'A disappointment?' echoed Horace, at a loss to know what was coming next. "'I refer to the fact which possibly, however, escaped your notice,' explained the professor." scratching his scanty patch of grizzled whisker with a touch of irascibility, that I myself was not at home on that occasion. Indeed, I was greatly disappointed, said Horace, though, of course, I know how much you are engaged. It's all the more good of you to spare the time to drop in for a chat just now. I've not come to chat, Mr. Ventimore. I never chat. I wanted to see you about a matter which I thought you might be so obliging as to, but I observe you are busy probably too busy to attend to such a small affair. It was clear enough now. The professor was going to build, and had decided, could it be at Sylvia's suggestion, to entrust the work to him. But he contrived to subdue any self-betraying eagerness, and reply, as he could with perfect truth, that he had nothing on hand just then which he could not lay aside, and that if the professor would let him know what he required, he would take it up at once. "'So much the better,' said the professor. "'So much the better. "'Both my wife and daughter declared that it was making far too great a demand upon your good nature. "'But, as I told them, 
i am much mistaken i said if mr ventimore's practice is so extensive that he cannot leave it for one afternoon evidently it was not a house could he be needed to escort them somewhere that afternoon even that was more than he had hoped for a few minutes since he hastened to repeat that he was perfectly free that afternoon in that case said the professor beginning to fumble in all his pockets was he searching for a note in sylvia's handwriting in that case you will be conferring a real favour on me if you could make it convenient to attend a sale at hammond's auction rooms in covent garden and just bid for one or two articles on my behalf whatever disappointment ventimore felt it may be said to his credit that he allowed no sign of it to appear of course i'll go with pleasure he said if i can be of any use i knew i shouldn't come to you in vain said the professor i remembered your wonderful good nature sir in accompanying my wife and daughter on all sorts of expeditions in the blazing hot weather we had at st luke when you might have remained quietly at the hotel with me not that i should trouble you now only i have to lunch at the oriental club and i've an appointment afterwards to examine a report on a recently discovered inscribed cylinder for the museum which will fully occupy the rest of the afternoon so that it's physically impossible for me to go to hammond's myself and i strongly object to employing a broker when i can avoid it where did i put that catalogue ah here it is this was sent to me by the executors of my old friend general collingham who died the other day i met him at the carder when i was out excavating some years ago he was something of a collector in his way though he knew very little about it and of course was taken in right and left most of his things are downright rubbish but there are just a few lots that are worth securing at a reasonable figure by someone who knew what he was about but my dear professor remonstrated horace not relishing this responsibility i'm afraid i'm as likely as not to pick up some of the rubbish i've no special knowledge of oriental curios at st luke said the professor you impress me with having for an amateur an exceptionally accurate and comprehensive acquaintance with egyptian and arabian art from the earliest period if this were so horace could only feel with shame what a fearful humbug he must have been however i've no wish to lay too heavy a burden on you and as you will see from this catalogue i have ticked off the lots in which i am chiefly interested and made a note of the limit to which i am prepared to bid so you'll have no difficulty very well said horace i'll go straight to covent garden and slip out and get some lunch later on well perhaps if you don't mind the lots i have marked seem to come on at rather frequent intervals but don't let that consideration deter you from getting your lunch and if you should miss anything by not being on the spot why it's of no consequence though i don't say it mightn't be a pity in any case you won't forget to mark what each lot fetches and perhaps you wouldn't mind dropping me a line when you return the catalogue or stay could you look in some time after dinner this evening and let me know how you got on that would be better horace thought it would be decidedly better and undertook to call and render an account of his stewardship that evening there remained the question of a deposit should one or more of the lots be knocked down to him and as he was obliged to own that he had not so much as ten pounds about him at that particular moment the professor extracted a note for that amount from his case and handed it to him with the air of a benevolent person relieving a deserving object don't exceed my limits he said for i can't afford more just now and mind you give hammond your own name not mine if the dealers get to know that i'm after the things they'll run you up and now i don't think i need detain you any longer especially as time is running on i'm sure i can trust you to do the best you can for me till this evening then a few minutes later horace was driving up to covent garden behind the best-looking horse he could pick out the professor might have required from him rather more than was strictly justified by their acquaintanceship and taken his acquiescence too much as a matter of course but what of that after all he was sylvia's parent even with my luck he was thinking i ought to succeed in getting at least one or two of the lots he's marked and if i can only please him something may come of it and in this sanguine mood horace entered messrs hammond's 
well-known auction rooms. End of chapter one. Recording by Adrian Wheel. Chapter two of The Brass Bottle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Wheel. The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey. Chapter 2. A Cheap Lot. In spite of the fact that it was the luncheon hour when Ventimore reached Hammond's auction rooms, he found the big, skylighted gallery where the sale of the furniture and effects of the late General Collingham was proceeding, crowded to a degree which showed that the deceased officer had some reputation as a connoisseur. The narrow green baize tables below the auctioneer's rostrum were occupied by professional dealers, one or two of them women, who sat, paper and pencil in hand, with much the same air of apparent apathy and real vigilance that may be noticed in the casino at Monte Carlo. Around them stood a decorous and business-like crowd, mostly dealers, of various types. On a magisterial-looking bench sat the auctioneer, conducting the sale with a judicial impartiality and a dignity which forbade him, even in his most laudatory comments, the faintest accent of enthusiasm. The October sunshine, striking through the glazed roof, regilded the tarnished gas stars, and suffused the dusty atmosphere with palest gold. But somehow the utter absence of excitement in the crowd, the calm, methodical tone of the auctioneer, and the occasional mournful cry of, "'Lot here, gentlemen!' from the porter, when any article was too large to move, all served to depress Ventimore's usually mercurial spirits. For all Horace knew, the collection as a whole might be of little value, but it very soon became clear that others beside Professor Futvoye had singled out such gems as there were, also that the Professor had considerably underrated the prices they were likely to fetch. Ventimore made his bids with all possible discretion, but time after time he found the competition for some perforated mosque lantern, engraved ewer, or ancient porcelain tile so great that his limit was soon reached, and his sole consolation was that the article eventually changed hands for sums which were very nearly double the professor's estimate. Several dealers and brokers, despairing of a bargain that day, left, murmuring profanities. Most of those who remained ceased to take a serious interest in the proceedings, and consoled themselves with cheap witticisms at every favourable occasion. The sale dragged slowly on, and what with continual disappointment and want of food, Horace began to feel so weary that he was glad, as the crowd thinned, to get a seat at one of the green baize tables, by which time the skylights had already changed from livid grey to slate colour in the deepening dusk. A couple of meek Burmese Buddhas had just been put up, and bore the indignity of being knocked down for nine and sixpence the pair, with dreamy, inscrutable simpers. Horace only waited for the final lot marked by the professor, an old Persian copper bowl, inlaid with silver, and engraved round the rim with an inscription from Hafiz. The limit to which he was authorised to go was two pounds ten, but so desperately anxious was Ventimore not to return empty-handed, that he had made up his mind to bid an extra sovereign if necessary, and say nothing about it. However, the bowl was put up, and the bidding soon rose to three pounds ten, four pounds, four pounds ten, five pounds, five guineas, for which last sum it was acquired by a bearded man on Horace's right, who immediately began to regard his purchase with a more indulgent eye. Ventimore had done his best, and failed. There was no reason now why he should stay a moment longer, and yet he sat on, from sheer fatigue and disinclination to move. "'Now we come to lot 254, gentlemen,' he heard the auctioneer say mechanically. "'A capital Egyptian mummy case in fine con—' "'No, I beg pardon, I'm wrong. Uh, "'This is an article which, by some mistake, has been omitted from the catalogue, "'though it ought to have been in it. "'Everything on sale today, gentlemen, belong to the late General Collingham. "'We'll call this number 253A, Antique Brass Bottle, Very Curious.' One of the porters carried the bottle in between the tables, and set it down before the dealers at the farther end with a tired nonchalance. It was an old, squat, pot-bellied vessel, about two feet high, with a long, thick neck, the mouth of which was closed by a sort of metal stopper or cap. 
There was no visible decoration on its sides, which were rough and pitted by some incrustation that had formed on them and been partially scraped off. As a piece of bric-a-brac, it certainly possessed few attractions, and there was a marked tendency to guy it among the more frivolous brethren. "'What do you call this, sir?' inquired one of the auctioneer, with the manner of a cheeky boy trying to get a rise out of his foremaster. "'Is it as unique as the others?' "'You're as well able to judge as I,' was the guarded reply. "'Any one can see for himself it's not modern rubbish.' "'Make a pretty little ornament for the mantelpiece,' remarked a wag. "'Is the top made to unscrew? Or what, sir?' said a third. "'Seems fixed on pretty tight.' "'I can't say. Probably it's never been removed for some time.' "'It's a goodish weight,' said the chief humorist, after handling. "'What's inside of it, sir? Sardines?' "'I don't represent it as having anything inside it,' said the auctioneer. "'If you want to know my opinion, I think there's money in it.' "'How much?' "'Don't misunderstand me, gentlemen. "'When I say I consider there's money in it, I'm not alluding to its contents. "'I've no reason to believe that it contains anything. "'I'm merely suggesting the thing itself may be worth more than it looks. "'Ah, oh, it might be that without hurting itself.' "'Well, well, don't let us waste time. "'Look upon it as a pure speculation "'and make me an offer for it, some of you. "'Come.' "'Tuppence ain't me!' cried the comic man, "'affecting to brace himself for a mighty effort. "'Pray be serious, gentlemen. "'We want to get on, you know. "'Anything to make a start. Five shillings. "'It's not the value of the metal, but I'll take the bid. Six. Look at it well. "'It's not an article you come across "'every day of your lives.' The bottle was still being passed round, with disrespectful raps and slaps, and it had now come to Ventimore's right-hand neighbour, who scrutinised it carefully, but made no bid. "'That's all right, you know,' he whispered in Horace's ear. "'That's good stuff, that is. If I was you, I'd have that.' Seven shillings. Eight. Nine bid for it over there in the corner,' said the auctioneer. "'If you think it's so good, why don't you have it yourself?' Horace asked his neighbour. Me. Oh, well, it ain't exactly in my line, and getting to this last lot pretty near cleaned me out. I've done for today, I have. All the same, it is a curiosity. Don't know as I've seen a brass vase just that shape before, and it's genuine old, though all these fellows are too ignorant to know the value of it, so I don't mind giving you the tip. Horace rose, the better to examine the top. As far as he could make out, in the flickering light of one of the gas stars, which the auctioneer had just ordered to be lit, there were half-erased scratches and triangular marks on the cap that might possibly be an inscription. If so, might there not be the means here of regaining the professor's favour, which he felt that, as it was, he should probably forfeit, justly or not, by his ill success. He could hardly spend the professor's money on it, since it was not in the catalogue, and he had no authority to bid for it, but he had a few shillings of his own to spare. Why not bid for it on his own account, as long as he could afford to do so? If he were outbid, as usual, it would not particularly matter. Thirteen shillings, the auctioneer was saying, in his dispassionate tones. Horace caught his eye, and slightly raised his catalogue, while another man nodded at the same time. Fourteen, in two places. Horace raised his catalogue again. I won't go beyond fifteen, he thought. Fifteen, it's against you, sir. Any advance on fifteen? Sixteen? This very quaint old oriental bottle going for only sixteen shillings. After all, thought Horace, I don't mind anything under a pound for it. And he bid seventeen shillings. Eighteen! cried his rival, a short, cheery, cherub-faced little dealer, whose neighbours abjured him to sit quite like a good little boy and not waste his pocket money. Nineteen, said Horace. Pound, answered the cherubic man. "'A pound only for this grand brass vessel,' said the auctioneer indifferently. "'All done at a pound.' Horace thought another shilling or two would not ruin him, and nodded. "'A guinea. For the last time, you'll lose it, sir,' said the auctioneer to the little man. "'Go on, Tommy. Don't be beat. Spring another bob on it, Tommy,' his friends advised him ironically. But Tommy shook his head, with the air of a man who knows when to draw the line. "'One guinea, and that's not half its value.' "'Gentlemen on my left,' said the auctioneer more in sorrow than in anger, and the brass bottle became Ventimore's property. He paid for it, and since he could hardly walk home nursing a large metal bottle without attracting an inconvenient amount of attention, directed that it should be sent to his lodgings at Vincent Square. But when he was out in the fresh air, walking westward to his club, 
he found himself wondering more and more what could have possessed him to throw away a guinea when he had few enough for legitimate expenses on an article of such exceedingly problematical value. End of chapter 2 Recording by Adrian Wheel Chapter 3 of The Brass Bottle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Wheel The Brass Bottle by F. Anstey Chapter 3 An Unexpected Opening Ventimore made his way to Cottesmore Gardens that evening in a highly inconsistent, not to say chaotic, state of mind. The thought that he would presently see Sylvia again made his blood course quicker, while he was fully determined to say no more to her than civility demanded. At one moment he was blessing Professor Futvoye for his happy thought in making use of him. At another he was bitterly recognising that it would have been better for his peace of mind if he had been left alone. Sylvia and her mother had no desire to see more of him. If they had, they would have asked him to come before this. No doubt they would tolerate him now, for the professor's sake, but who would not rather be ignored than tolerated? The more often he saw Sylvia, the more she would make his heart ache with vain longing, whereas he was getting almost reconciled to her indifference. He would very soon be cured if he didn't see her. Why should he see her? He need not go in at all. He had merely to leave the catalogue with his compliments, and the professor would learn all he wanted to know. On second thoughts, he must go in, if only to return the banknote. But he would ask to see the professor in private. Most probably he would not be invited to join his wife and daughter, but if he were, he could make some excuse. They might think it a little odd, a little discourteous perhaps, but they would be too relieved to care much about that. When he got to Cottesmore Gardens, and was actually at the door of the Fatfoy's house, one of the neatest and demurest in that retired and irreproachable quarter, he began to feel the craven hope that the professor might be out, in which case he need only leave the catalogue and write a letter when he got home, reporting his non-success at the sale and returning the note. As it happened, the professor was out, and Horace was not so glad as he thought he should be, the maid told him that the ladies were in the drawing-room, and seemed to take it for granted that he was coming in, so he had himself announced. He would not stay long, just long enough to explain his business there, and make it clear that he had no wish to force his acquaintance upon them. He found Mrs. Futvoye in the farther part of the pretty double drawing-room, writing letters, and Sylvia, more dazzlingly fair than ever, in some sort of gauzy black frock with a heliotrope sash and a bunch of palmer violets on her breast, was comfortably established with a book in the front room, and seemed surprised, if not resentful, at having to disturb herself. "'I must apologise, he began with an involuntary stiffness, for calling at this very unceremonious time, but the fact is the professor—' "'I know all about it,' interrupted Mrs. Futvoye, brusquely, while her shrewd, light grey eyes took him in with a cool stare that was humorously observant, without being aggressive. "'We heard how shamefully my husband abused your good nature. "'Really, it was too bad of him to ask a busy man like you "'to put aside his work and go and spend a whole day at that stupid auction. "'Oh, I had nothing particular to do. "'I can't call myself a busy man, unfortunately,' said Horace, "'with that frankness which scorns to conceal what other people know perfectly well already. "'All right, it's very nice of you to make light of it, "'but he ought not to have done it, after so short an acquaintance, too.' and to make it worse he has had to go out unexpectedly this evening but he'll be back before long if you don't mind waiting there's really no need to wait said horace because this catalogue will tell him everything and as particular things he wanted went for much more than he thought i wasn't able to get any of them i'm sure i'm very glad of it said mrs futvoye for his study is crammed with odds and ends as it is and i don't want the whole house to look like a museum or an antiquity shop I had all the trouble in the world to persuade him that a great gaudy gilded mummy case was not quite the thing for a drawing room. But please sit down, Mr. Ventimore. Thanks, stammered Horace, but but I mustn't stay. If you will tell the professor how sorry I was to miss him, and, and give him back this note which he left with me to cover my deposits, I, I won't interrupt you any longer. He was, as a rule, 
imperturbable in most social emergencies, but just now he was seized with a wild desire to escape, which, to his infinite mortification, made him behave like a shy schoolboy. Nonsense, said Mrs. Fatfoy. I am sure my husband would be most annoyed if we didn't keep you till he came. I really ought to go, he declared wistfully enough. We mustn't tease Mr. Ventimore to stay, mother, when he so evidently wants to go, said Sylvia, cruelly. Well, I won't detain you, at least not long. I wonder if you would mind posting a letter for me as you pass the pillar-box. I've almost finished it, and it ought to go to-night, and my maid Jessie has such a bad cold I really don't like sending her out with it. It would have been impossible to refuse to stay after that, even if he had wished. It would only be for a few minutes. Sylvia might spare him that much of her time. He should not trouble her again. So Mrs. Futvoye went back to her bureau, and Sylvia and he were practically alone. She had taken a seat not far from his, and made a few constrained remarks, obviously out of sheer civility. He returned mechanical replies with a dreary wonder whether this could really be the girl who had talked to him with such charming friendliness and confidence only a few weeks ago in Normandy. And the worst of it was, she was looking more bewitching than ever, her slim arms gleaming through the black lace of her sleeves, and the gold threads in her soft masses of chestnut hair sparkling in the light of the shaded lamp behind her. The slight contraction of her eyebrows and the mutinous downward curve of her mouth seemed expressive of boredom. "'What a dreadfully long time Mamma is over that letter,' she said at last. "'I think I'd better go and hurry her up. Please don't, unless you are particularly anxious to get rid of me.' "'I thought you seemed particularly anxious to escape,' she said coldly. "'And, as a family, we have certainly taken half enough of your time for one day.' "'That's not the way you used to talk at St. Luke,' he said. "'At St. Luke? Perhaps not.' But in London everything is so different, you see. Very different. When one meets people abroad who seem at all inclined to be sociable, she continued, one is so apt to think them pleasanter than they really are. Then one meets them again, and wonders what one ever saw to like in them. And it's no use pretending one feels the same, because they generally understand sooner or later. Don't you find that? I do indeed, he said, wincing. Though I don't know what I've done to deserve that you should tell me so. "'Oh, I was not blaming you. You have been most angelic. I can't think how Papa could have expected you to take all that trouble for him. Still, you did, though you must have simply hated it. But good heavens, don't you know I should be only too delighted to be of the least service to him, or to any of you? You looked anything but delighted when you came in just now. You looked as if your one idea was to get it over as soon as you could.' You know perfectly well you're longing now for Mother to finish her letter and set you free. Do you really think I can't see that? If all that is true, or partly true, said Horace, can't you guess why? I guessed how it was when you called here first that afternoon. Mamma had asked you to, and you thought you might as well be civil. Perhaps you really did think it would be pleasant to see us again, but it wasn't the same thing. Oh, I saw it in your face directly. You became conventional and distant and horrid and it made me horrid too and you went away determined that you wouldn't see any more of us than you could help that's why i was so furious when i heard that papa had been to see you and with such an object all this was so near the truth and yet missed it with such perverse ingenuity that horace felt bound to put himself right perhaps i ought to leave things as they are he said but i can't it's no earthly use i know but but may I tell you why it really was painful to me to meet you again? I thought you were changed, that you wished to forget, and wished me to forget, only I can't, that we had been friends for a short time. And though I never blamed you, it was natural enough, it hit me pretty hard, so hard that I didn't feel anxious to repeat the experience. Did it hit you hard? said Sylvia softly. Perhaps I minded too, just a very little. However, she added with a sudden smile that made two enchanting dimples in her cheeks, it only shows how much more sensible it is to have things out. Now, perhaps, you won't persist in keeping away from us. I believe, said Horace gloomily, still determined not to let any direct avowal pass his lips, it would be best that I should keep away. Her half-closed eyes shone through their long lashes 
The violets on her breast rose and fell. "'I don't think I understand,' she said, in a tone that was both hurt and offended. "'There is a pleasure in yielding to some temptations that more than compensates for the pain of any previous resistance. Come what might, he was not going to be misunderstood any longer. "'If I must tell you,' he said, "'I've fallen desperately, hopelessly in love with you. Now you know the reason.' doesn't seem a very good reason for wanting to go away and never see me again, does it? Not when I've no right to speak to you of love. But you've done that. I know, he said penitently. I couldn't help it, but I never meant to. It slipped out. I quite understand how hopeless it is. Of course, if you're so sure as all that, you're quite right not to try. Sylvia, you can't mean that, that you do care, after all. Didn't you really see she said, with a low, happy laugh. How stupid of you, and how dear! He caught her hand, which she allowed to rest contentedly in his. Oh, Sylvia, then you do, you do. But, my God, what a selfish brute I am, for we can't marry. It may be years before I can ask you to come to me. Your father and mother wouldn't hear of your being engaged to me. Need they hear of it just yet, Horace? Yes, they must. I should feel a cur if I didn't tell your mother at all events. Then you shan't feel a cur, for we'll go and tell her together. And Sylvia rose and went into the farther room and put her arms around her mother's neck. Mother, darling, she said in a half whisper, it's really all your fault for writing such very long letters, but, but, we don't exactly know how we came to do it, but Horace and I have got engaged somehow. You aren't very angry, are you? "'I think you're both extremely foolish,' said Mrs. Fatvoy, as she extricated herself from Sylvia's arms and turned to face Horace. "'From all I hear, Mr. Ventimore, you're not in a position to marry at present.' "'Unfortunately, no,' said Horace. "'I'm making nothing at yet. But my chance must come some day. I don't ask you to give me Sylvia till then.' "'And you know you like Horace, mother,' pleaded Sylvia. "'And I'm ready to wait for him any time. Nothing will induce me to give him up.' and I shall never, never care for anybody else. So, you see, may just as well give your consent. I'm afraid I've been to blame, said Mrs. Futvoy. I ought to have foreseen this at St. Luke. Sylvia is our only child, Mr. Ventimore, and I would far rather see her happily married than making what is called a grand match. Still, this really does seem rather hopeless. I'm quite sure her father would never approve of it. Indeed, it must not be mentioned to him. He would only be irritated. So long as you're not against us, said Horace, you won't forbid me to see her. I believe I ought to, said Mrs. Futvoy, but I don't object to your coming here occasionally, as an ordinary visitor. Only understand this. Until you can prove to my husband's satisfaction that you're able to support Sylvia in the manner she has been accustomed to, there must be no formal engagement. I think I am entitled to ask that of you. She was so clearly within her rights, and so much more indulgent than Horace had expected, for he had always considered her an unsentimental and rather worldly woman, that he accepted her conditions almost gratefully. After all, it was enough for him that Sylvia returned his love, and that he should be allowed to see her from time to time. "'It's rather a pity,' said Sylvia, meditatively, a little later, when her mother had gone back to her letter-writing, and she and Horace were discussing the future. It's rather a pity that you didn't manage to get something at the sale. It might have helped you with Papa. Well, I did get something on my own account, he said, though I don't know whether it is likely to do me any good with your father. And he told her how he had come to acquire the brass bottle. And you actually gave a guinea for it, said Sylvia, when you could probably get exactly the same thing, only better, at liberties for about seven and sixpence. Nothing of that sort has any charms for Papa, unless it's dirty and dingy and centuries old. This looks all that. I only bought it because, though it wasn't down on the catalogue, I had a fancy that it might interest the Professor. Oh! cried Sylvia, clasping her pretty hands. If only it does, Horace, if it turns out to be tremendously rare and valuable, I do believe Dad would be so delighted that he'd consent to anything. Ah! Oh! That's his step outside. He's letting himself in. Now, mind you, don't forget to tell him about that bottle. The professor did not seem in the sweetest of humours as he entered the drawing-room. Sorry I was obliged to be from home, and there was nobody but my wife and daughter here to entertain you, but I'm glad you stayed. Yes, I'm rather glad you stayed. 
"'So am I, sir,' said Horace, and proceeded to give his account of the sale, which did not serve to improve the professor's temper. He thrust out his underlip at certain items in the catalogue. "'I wish I had gone myself,' he said. "'That bowl, a really fine example of sixteenth-century Persian work, going for only five guineas. I'd willingly have given ten for it. Uh, there, there. I thought I could have depended on you to use your judgment better than that.' "'If you remember, sir, you strictly limited me to the sums you marked.' "'Nothing of the sort,' said the professor testily. "'My marginal notes were merely intended as indications, no more. "'You might have known that if you had secured one of the things at any price I should have approved.' Horace had no grounds for knowing anything of the kind, and much reason for believing the contrary, but he saw no use in arguing the matter further, and merely said he was sorry to have misunderstood. "'No doubt the fault was mine,' said the professor, in a tone that implied the opposite. "'Still, making every allowance for inexperience in these matters, I should have thought it impossible for any one to spend a whole day bidding at a place like Hammond's without even securing a single article. But that, put in Sylvia, Mr. Ventimore did get one thing on his own account. It's a brass bottle, not down in the catalogue, but he thinks it may be worth something, perhaps, and he'd very much like to have your opinion. Chuh, said the professor. Some modern bizarre work, most probably. He'd better have kept his money. What was this bottle of yours like, now? Eh? Horace described it. Hmph. Seems to be what the Arabs call a kumkum. Probably used as a sprinkler, or to hold rose water. Hundreds of them about, commented the professor, crustily. It had a lid, riveted or soldered on, said Horace. The general shape was something like this, and he made a rapid sketch from memory, which the professor took reluctantly, and then adjusted his glasses with some increase of interest. Ha! Huh. The form is antique, certainly, and the top hermetically fastened, eh? "'That looks as if it might contain something.' "'You don't think it has a genie inside, "'like the sealed jar the fisherman found in the Arabian Nights?' "'cried Sylvia. "'What fun if it had!' "'By genie, I presume you mean a genie, "'which is the more correct and scholarly term,' said Professor. "'Female, genie, and plural, gin. "'No, I do not contemplate that as a probable contingency, "'but it is not quite impossible that a vessel closed, as Mr. Ventimore describes, may have been designed as a receptacle for papyri or other records of archaeological interest, which may be still in preservation. I should recommend you, sir, to use the greatest precaution in removing the lid. Don't expose the documents, if any, too suddenly to the outer air, and it would be better if you did not handle them yourself. I shall be rather curious to hear whether it really does contain anything, and if so, what? I will open it as carefully as possible, said Horace, and whatever it may contain, you may rely upon my letting you know at once. He left shortly afterwards, encouraged by the radiant trust in Sylvia's eyes, and thrilled by the secret pressure of her hand at parting. He had been amply repaid for all the hours he had spent in the close sail-room. His luck had turned at last. He was going to succeed. He felt it in the air, as if he were already fanned by fortune's pinions. Still thinking of Sylvia, he let himself into the semi-detached, old-fashioned house on the north side of Vincent Square, where he had lodged for some years. It was nearly twelve o'clock, and his landlady, Mrs. Rapkin, and her husband had already gone to bed. Ventimore went up to his sitting-room, a comfortable apartment with two long windows, opening on to a trellised veranda and balcony, a room which, as he had furnished and decorated it himself to suit his own tastes, had none of the depressing ugliness of typical lodgings. It was quite dark, for the season was too mild for a fire, and he had to grope for the matches before he could light his lamp. After he had done so, and turned up the wicks, the first object he saw was the bulbous long-necked jar, which he had bought that afternoon, and which now stood on the stained boards near the mantelpiece. It had been delivered with unusual promptitude. Somehow he felt a sort of repulsion at the sight of it. "'It's a beastlier looking object than I thought,' he said to himself disgustedly. "'A chimney-pot would be about as decorative and appropriate in my room. What a thundering ass I was to waste a guinea on it! I wonder if there really is anything inside it. It is so infernally ugly that it ought to be useful. The professor seemed to fancy it might hold documents, and he ought to know. Anyway, I'll find out before I turn in. 
He grasped it by its long, thick neck, and tried to twist the cap off, but it remained firm, which was not surprising, seeing that it was thickly covered with a lava-like crust. "'I must get some of that off first, and then try again,' he decided, and after foraging downstairs, he returned with a hammer and chisel, with which he chipped away the crust till the line of the cap was revealed, and an uncouth metal knob that seemed to be a catch. This he tapped sharply for some time, and again attempted to wrench off the lid. Then he gripped the vessel between his knees, and put forth all his strength, while the bottle seemed to rock and heave under him in sympathy. The cap was beginning to give way very slightly. One last wrench, and it came off in his hand with such suddenness that he was flung violently backwards, and hit the back of his head smartly against an angle of the wainscot. He had a vague impression of the bottle lying on its side with dense volumes of hissing black smoke pouring out of its mouth and towering up in a gigantic column to the ceiling. He was conscious, too, of a pungent and peculiarly overpowering perfume. "'I've got hold of some sort of infernal machine,' he thought, "'and I shall be all over the square in less than a second. And just as he arrived at this cheerful conclusion, he lost consciousness altogether. He could not have been unconscious for more than a few seconds, for when he opened his eyes the room was still thick with smoke, through which he dimly discerned the figure of a stranger, who seemed of abnormal and almost colossal height. But this must have been an optical illusion caused by the magnifying effects of the smoke, for, as it cleared, his visitor proved to be of no more than ordinary stature. He was elderly, and indeed venerable of appearance, and wore an eastern robe and headdress of a dark green hue. He stood there with uplifted hands, uttering something in a loud tone, and a language unknown to Horace. Ventimore, being still somewhat dazed, felt no surprise at seeing him. Mrs. Rapkin must have left her second floor at last to some oriental. He would have preferred an Englishman as a fellow lodger, but this foreigner must have noticed the smoke and rushed in to offer assistance, which was both neighbourly and plucky of him. "'Awfully good of you to come in, sir,' he said, as he scrambled to his feet. "'I don't know what's happened exactly, but there's no harm done. I'm only a trifle shaken, that's all. By the way, I suppose you can speak English?' "'Assuredly I can speak so as to be understood by all whom I address,' answered the stranger." "'Dost thou not understand my speech?' "'Perfectly now,' said Horace. "'But you made a remark just now which I didn't follow. "'Would you mind repeating it?' "'I said, "'Repentance, O prophet of God, "'I will not return to the like conduct ever.' "'Ah,' said Horace, "'I dare say you were rather startled. "'So was I when I opened that bottle. "'Tell me, was it indeed thy hand that removed the seal?' O oh, young man of kindness and good works. I certainly did open it, said Ventimore, though I don't know where the kindness comes in, for I've no notion what was inside the thing. I was inside it, said the stranger, calmly. End of chapter 3 Recording by Adrian Wheel